right, good afternoon, everybody. We have an excellent talk, very, uh, very interesting talk. It should be very informative. Um, so just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Gabe Bon. I'm a technical account manager with Sony Interactive Entertainment America. And I'm part of the uh, developer technologies group, and we're a dedicated uh, support team that you know, helps our developers make best games on our platform. And uh, I do want to thank Alchemy for agreeing to do a sponsored session. I think you know, rather than us just kind of telling you how games should be made on our platform, you know, having you know, an actual developer talk about their experience of being a launch title, and then just you know, a lot of information to help you, you know, publish your games on our platform, and all that information should be very helpful. So we are very grateful for that. And even if you're not a VR developer, um, you know, the publishing process is exactly the same for non-VR titles or any, anything that you make on our platform. So it should be very informative to you. And we have a, a large contingent of Sony people here at Unite, and uh, they got their hands raised. Uh, we'll be around after the talk to answer any questions. And uh, I think uh, the session itself has a little bit of Q&A, but uh, please uh, welcome you know, Alex and Devin from Alchemy. Thanks, Gabe. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming to the uh, Bringing Job Simulator to PlayStation VR talk. Uh, my name is Alex Schwartz, and I'm the CEO and janitor at Alchemy Labs. And I'm Devin Reimer, CTO, uh, Chief Technical Owl at Alchemy Labs. So uh, we're the developers of a game called Job Simulator. Uh, it is a triple platform uh, VR launch title. So we launched on the HTC Vive. Oculus Touch launch is coming very soon. And we just launched on PlayStation VR. So we're going to show you our trailer of the game so you have an idea of what's going on in that. So there you go. That is Job Simulator. Um, so we are currently the number one most popular uh, PlayStation VR game, which is very, very cool. Yeah. So uh, I want to talk about um, launching the game on PlayStation VR. So uh, when we got to this point, we were already in a really good spot with the game. So the game is a Unity-based game, um, and PlayStation VR has Unity-based support. Um, and we had been developing the game with multi-platform in mind, um, thinking right from the get-go, what would this game be like on multiple different platforms? Um, so with the game design, we require two hands and a head to be tracked, uh, six degrees of freedom. And uh, on PlayStation VR with the Move controllers, we have that. Uh, we designed it with a cartoony aesthetic in mind, um, particularly because of performance constraints. And uh, we came into this with existing knowledge on how to heavily optimize Unity from our mobile background over many, many years. So um, the, basically, the, the road to being a launch title on PSVR, you shouldn't just assume that because Unity has support for it, you just hit the big easy button. And there you go, you have uh, the port completed because you know, it just works. Um, so for us, we were very early to this process. 
uh, bringing Job Simulator to, uh, actually building the game itself was a 15 month uh, development cycle. And then uh, seven months of development time was needed to create the PlayStation VR port. And that was done over a longer calendar period. Uh, but it's really important to note that uh, being, we were a launch title on a brand new platform that was emerging and basically being built as we were building that content. So the rules of the platform were actually being defined as we were going through it, kind of like in, in this GIF, you're just kind of chugging along as you're trying to get there. Um, you know, the Unity PSVR support was actually fledgling at the time that we started working on it. Uh, there were a ton of features that were lacking, a ton of bugs that we came up against actually first, and we were using alpha versions of things. The light at the end of the tunnel is though, we hit a lot of those bugs first, and then they've been solved. And so going through this process will actually be a lot easier, faster, and smoother uh, today. But you know, the launch titles, I think, got the, the brunt of some of the, the harder process getting through. And so we're going to talk about uh, some of the, the challenges from a design standpoint when bringing games to PlayStation VR. So as I mentioned earlier um, about the controllers um, in particular, uh, we've got to this amazing point where the three major platforms have this kind of controller parity. So each of them have six degrees of freedom tracking and a trigger. Um, so that means that if we target these, um, we can end up bringing our content to many places. So, one thing to keep in mind when designing for different VR platforms is every platform has a little bit of different tracking methods. So for example, with PlayStation VR, it has one forward-facing camera that's generally positioned above the television. Um, and this is really important to understand because if you end up turning away from that camera and end up blocking your controllers with your body or with another hand, you'll end up losing tracking um, with that hand. So you end up having to develop with forward facing in mind. If you end up having a title already existing that was based on 360 tracking, where it was like, oh, I can turn all the way around with my controllers, you're going to have to do significant work to kind of redesign and rethink how the gameplay would work in a forward facing world. Um, so in Job Simulator, the way we ended up doing this was we ended up building a tool that let designers Re, uh, redesign every play space so every job gets relayed out so objects that were behind you end up being moved to things in front of you and new models get brought in and the entire space ends up getting designed to afford that play space. So, um, you know, we have all the elements in the game that are reachable within the uh, constraints of the frustum, and so you've got a great experience for every single PlayStation VR user because we know the exact dimensions of the camera, we could build the level for that uh, actual thing. But we still need to handle uh, hands moving out of bounds in various situations or hands uh, having kind of a quality of tracking degradation. So for example, like you said, if you turn away from the camera and block, block yourself, you have to do something to inform the user that they're turned in a way that's, that's you know, not supported or you reach way out. Now uh, the HMD itself has a system level uh, acknowledgement of your head is out of tracking, come back to tracking. Uh, developers have to handle on their own what you want to do with your hands. Um, so what we actually did is we have a solution that detects whether the uh, tracking quality, there's an enum that you can kind of pull, whether the tracking quality goes down, so that's either out of the frustum or behind you. Uh, we use transparency as a piece of feedback for the user, so the hand goes transparent, you realize, oh, I, I went way too far outside of that. Uh, or um, you know, if you have an item in your hand, we actually do the thing called tomato presence, so it only shows that item, and that item actually gets the transparent uh, feedback as well, so you always know, uh, you know where the, the bounds of your tracking are. Um, and so, in addition, floor level uh, tracking cannot be guaranteed, and it's based on the fact that we don't know the exact angle and setup of that person's camera and where they put it and how, how far down or up it's, it's angled. Uh, and so, um, as far as not knowing whether a user could reach below, for example, their knees, um, we built a floor level recycling system for the game that's actually uh, fairly complicated that goes through, if you have an important item in your hand and you drop it on the floor and that floor is actually out of tracking, if you go and reach for it, you're gonna have a disappointing moment where you hand, your hand loses tracking. So instead, we actually query a bunch of valid locations that the item can uh, pop to and use a recycling system and a pooling system and then do 3D positional audio that shows, okay, I just heard where it got teleported to and I can go and grab that. And it's, it's complicated in the sense that you don't want it spawning on top of other items and that area has to be clear and all that. So we do that. Um, also, we don't have an accurate floor representation from the system level. And so we don't know the actual floor height. Uh, in seated VR, you know, that, that's not as um, necessary. In standing VR, you need to know where the floor is. And so, you know, all your lives we've been looking down and understanding how tall we are. And if you're two inches too tall or two inches too short, you notice it in VR when you're standing. So uh, we built our own um, 
method of calibrating the floor height, which we're calling the uh, arms out Vitruvian man situation, or, and Devin's gonna explain that. So um, the way it works is you end up having your two move controllers and you reach out with your arms fully uh, extended and then you pull the triggers. Um, and then what we do is we take the distance between your fingers so and the end of the move controllers and then reverse calculate based on that because what ends up happening is people's average wingspan is approximately their height. So we take an offset from the HMD, go down to the floor, and then once we have the floor position for that person, we end up working back to the camera and then determining how far the camera is off the ground. And what makes this method really special is it's now calibrated the distance from the, con the camera to the ground, which is now made for universal tracking so once one person calibrates it anyone else can go play with any height and it'll just work for them and they'll be the appropriate height that they actually are in real life so um, performance is going to be one of those major things to talk about when it comes to uh, bring you know porting games and so I want to kind of jump into that uh, skipping all the way to the end of, of uh, all the perf work that we did we ended up shipping job simulator at 90 Hertz uh, with MSAA at 8x uh, and doing super sampling at 1.4 times the render target size uh, and keeping a uh, single directional light with the highest resolution dynamic shadows. And uh, we didn't end up doing this because we thought it would be a fun challenge and we're gluttons for punishment. Uh, so when it comes to actually 90 hertz, um, PlayStation VR has a thing called reprojection, so you could run your game at 60 hertz and then you reproject to 120. Rotational uh, look is gonna be extremely smooth and buttery smooth, and then your game loops are running at 60 hertz. There's also, you, can, you could do 90 hertz native. Uh, we chose to do 90 hertz native because when you have hands in VR and you're moving them, um, there's no way to reproject that motion, and so you're gonna feel your hands moving at 60 hertz, uh, and it's something that is noticeable, and we felt for the quality bar that we wanted for Job Simulator, we thought we'd push super, super hard to get it to actually everything run natively at 90. Uh, MSAA at eight and 1.4X super sampling are super important just for the quality bar of what we're going for. Uh, we wanted a really nice, smooth experience where you don't see aliasing or edges uh, shimmering. And then the dynamic shadows, again, is not a visual aesthetic type of thing. Uh, it looks nice, but it's actually super important for your depth perception in VR is having quality shadows that are accurately represented. So all really important stuff. Yeah, people actually use that to determine when they're putting things down on surfaces how far that object is from that surface. Um, so it ends up becoming very important to gameplay. Um, so from a performance standpoint on the CPU, um, so on the PlayStation, uh, the CPU is not as strong as the desktop, uh, desktop CPU, um, but it has many cores, um, which ends up being a little bit problematic currently with Unity because generally within Unity, you're so main thread bound. Um, so most people I've talked to that uh, worked on PlayStation uh, VR development have said that we, they are bottlenecked on the uh, CPU, and we were the exact same way. Um, so some of the main uh, things when it comes to bottlenecking was uh, physics. So physics is incredibly important to Job Simulator and I think incredibly important to most uh, VR things. So it is one of those things you just can't remove. Um, shadows, uh, as we mentioned before, they're just incredibly important, but they are quite costly. And then um, the actual draws and submits of doing renders, um, rendering can actually be pretty significant on doing those submissions to the GPU. Um, so at the very end, after we finished all of our optimizations, here's what uh, our average um, 11 millisecond render looked like. About three and a half milliseconds for rendering, about four milliseconds uh, for physics if you're really interacting with the world, another uh, millisecond and a half for shadows. So at 90 hertz means you're running 11 millisecond frames. That means that approximately you got about a millisecond and a half to do essentially all the game itself. Um, which is uh, quite challenging, and it means you just gotta keep, uh, keep in the back of your mind all the performance things uh, that you need to make sure you do correctly. And also, make sure to use single pass rendering. That will essentially save you a, a ton, a ton of performance. So, on the GPU front, uh, on the PlayStation, the GPU is quite strong. Uh, it's still weaker than a modern desktop GPU, um, but one of the things that ends up helping you out a little bit is the native resolution of the displays of a PlayStation VR is slightly less uh, than some PC uh, VR headsets, so you end up getting a little bit of a savings there, um, but you still have to very heavily optimize to make sure that you can make frame rate. So uh, when it comes to optimization specific to Job Simulator uh, and for PlayStation VR's port, uh, one of the things is we had to go and find areas of uh, excessive overdraw uh, in transparencies and reduce those. Specifically, we had some particle effects that were uh, pretty rough on us for, for frame rate purposes on the GPU, uh, and reducing that overdraw was actually really helpful. 
Um, and the, the thing with multiple cameras is actually a, quite a depth here. So uh, multiple cameras caused some issues, but they also had some, some huge wins. So we do all of our UI and, um, and 2D work in the game uh, using canvas renderers in Unity, Unity's UI and canvases. But um, there's actually, when you move a canvas, the, if you do like the root and move it around, um, you get an entire uh, redraw of the, the whole transform hierarchy every single frame. And so what we do is we do all of our UI for, let's say, the job board that gives you all the instructions and in the office, that computer where you use the mouse and keyboard. Uh, all of those happen off screen in, in the distance and we use a camera rendering to a render target, a render texture, and then that render texture is slapped on in the scene. So we can actually animate, for example, that job board slightly to add a little juiciness to it, but it's not actually moving the transform of the, um, of the canvas. And that means also that we could take those extra cameras and render them at a lower frame rate than the 90 hertz that we're running at. And that is super, super key to us being able to hit performance. You don't need this computer updating at the 90 hertz. You don't need the job board, which sits there statically for a long time and then eventually does an animation, shows the next thing. That doesn't need to be rendering all of those canvas elements every single frame at 90 hertz. So we cut that down to every third frame, uh, and it's really helpful for us. In addition, the way the office is laid out, if you rem remember, there's the job board over here, the computer over here, and so we do a gaze-based operation where let's just stop rendering the computer camera at all if I'm not looking at it. So if it's out of uh, view for them, just don't render it at all, and that means that we can save a ton uh, from that standpoint. So some other performance-related things. Um, we end up dividing up large operations across multiple frames. Um, so what we ended up doing was looking through the game and finding any uh, large functions that were taking a lot of CPU time, and then trying to determine how we could split this across a few frames. And we end up doing this in a lot of places where it's like frame one does part of the process, frame two does the other part, frame three finishes it up, and then, and then we loop ends up dividing that frame across multi that that operation across multiple frames it ends up saving you a lot in certain places uh, we went through and removed as many updates and late updates as possible um, the good thing for us is right from the very beginning of us working on job simulator uh, we let all the devs know essentially that updates and late updates were going to kill the game uh, because at 90 frames a second you just don't have a lot of time to do anything um, so right from the very beginning of the game we ended up doing that and I recommend that people kind of keep that in mind right from the start because optimizing out uh, update and late update loops is very hard to do. Um, reduce your memory allocations to as close to zero as possible. Um, if your garbage collector is kicking in often, that will kill your frame rate because you're going to miss a frame every time it does. Um, and lastly, profile, profile, profile. This is literally the only way you're going to actually know what's going on behind the scenes. I've seen far too often people like, oh, I assume this part is the heavy part in the game, and they go optimize them, something that's actually running on another thread that isn't actually important to them. Use the profiler, um, and also be careful. Uh, why profiling on the PC is helpful, um, it doesn't paint a full picture. Profile actually on the hardware itself, the PlayStation hardware itself, because some things that on a PC might take a fraction of a millisecond might end up taking a couple milliseconds just because of the different architecture on PlayStation and vice versa. So profile on the platform. All right, uh, switching gears, uh, you know, actually getting the game to run at frame rate and all that is its own uh, task. Getting through certification and the business side of it is a whole other world, and I want to kind of talk about that. Um, first thing to note is that Sony is a highly regional company in the sense that uh, you've got Sony America, and then you've got Europe and Asia and Japan. And uh, you know, from a process standpoint, uh, you use different backends to interact with your builds on the Sony uh, Europe side than you do on the America side. And there's different processes when working between regions. Uh, you know, for example, some regions you can actually take your America build and then get that to in uh, Asia, for example, if you're doing English only. But again, it's 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 very specific to your uh, what you're doing with localization or not. Uh, just remember, you're building a build. It's not just one build. You're going to have a Europe build. You're going to have an America build. You're going to have all these different uh, multiple builds. Uh, each process through going through certification is regional as well. Uh, when in doubt, though, you ask your primary account manager. They can, to some extent, almost be like a human translator for who is it that I'm actually supposed to talk to at which region to do this, accomplish this task. Um, you know, things to remember. Ratings. You're a console developer now. You actually have to get ratings in all the regions that you're launching in. Um, you know, unlike something like Steam, you're going to need ESRB in America. You're going to need PEGI in Europe, uh, wherever you go. Localization uh, for small teams, depending on your size, that can be really costly, really time-consuming, and um, 
you know, it, it can be pretty tricky. Uh, even doing, so yeah, multiple months for a small team, even doing an uh, English only build, uh, a lot of regions are gonna require you to take your metadata and translate that content. So uh, that's something that you need to, you know, take into account when it comes to scheduling your uh, the whole process here. And uh, from a metadata standpoint, even just your store text and content, we had different trailers, for example, for Europe and for America and different marketing art per region. And so it's just, just take that into account when thinking about the, the timelines here. Um, so certification does take time and you need to budget for that. Uh, you don't just push builds live the night before you go launch like a, you know, on a PC platform, which would never be a good idea anyway. But certification is a big process you need to go through. Uh, for us, we happen to go through the, the process of doing TRC sweep, which can catch some of the uh, you know, TRC bugs that you might hit when you do master FQA submission, which is actually your certification. And then usually you'll mess something up and then maybe need to do something in a patch after that. And then there's VR consultation, which is a team uh, of folks who actually look at your content and determine if from a design comfort standpoint to make sure that what you're doing is, is you know, good in VR. And you're gonna need to book slots for all these different submissions in advance for each region, uh, sometimes. But um, there's also the concept of a waiver, uh, which is, you know, you would open a DevNet thread for any TRCs that you felt didn't apply directly to your game, which are rare, uh, but on a, there might be a case-by-case -case thing that could apply. A good example of that is uh, there was a TRC for holding the options button, uh, long pressing the options button, and it would recenter your view on PlayStation VR. Uh, that's totally a valid concept in seated VR in the sense that okay, I'm sitting here slightly off to the left and now I want that centered to where the cockpit is in this cockpit game or something. But when you're in, when we build something specific like our absolutely calibrated world space floor, you know, floor calibration for job simulator, holding that button shouldn't actually do anything because we've built, uh, you know, a standard calibration. So we got uh, a waiver for that and that's how that went. Um, additionally, keep in mind there's time zones, uh, differences for each entity, so you just gotta, kind of watch out if, about missing a deadline because it was a Japanese deadline or a uh, European time zone thing. Um, yeah. So uh, to go through some various tips here. Um, so uh, 3D audio, um, it's incredibly important. Uh, Unity PlayStation uh, support comes with built-in PlayStation 3D audio. Um, what we ended up doing was abstracting out our audio sources such that on PC they end up funneling over to a custom PC related spatializer and but then on PlayStation VR it switches over to using the built in native PlayStation 3, 3D audio solution. Um, so events, when you end up planning kind of your timelines, make sure to take in consideration uh, different dev events that you'll want to attend and uh, show content at and creating demos and all that kind of stuff. It, it takes up a lot of time. Um, iteration. Um, iteration time can be slow if you're pushing every single build um, that you do for testing to your, your uh, development kits themselves. Um, so we found it helpful to actually do some of the development on uh, the PC uh, VR. Um, it allows us to kind of iterate on the testing and finding issues uh, a little bit quicker. Yep, and uh, some more notes on submission. Uh, there's a bunch of different web backends that uh, you would be using to submit builds, not just DevNet or TPRNet, uh, various submission apps that you end up using. So lots of acronyms. Uh, basically, have whoever's doing the submission study and actually read through the documentation. Don't just assume that you're gonna wing it and go to the site and, and figure it all out at that moment. Uh, definitely, uh, you're gonna wanna spend time doing that. And take good notes on the whole submission process. You know, uh, it's a, a when you start in development and you learn some things, you want all those notes so you can refer back to it, uh, getting your login stored securely so you remember how to get through that. Uh, a good story of, of this whole process was um, we, we locked the game and finished it and we had this uh, patch that fixed a crash bug in Job Simulator and we had that as, set up as a day one patch so it would be all set for, for launch. And then we, had, um, we were in an early bundle with some press uh, kits and so press were playing our game leading up to the launch of PlayStation VR and then day one happened and uh, we were all excited and then we got reports on Twitter that morning saying, hey, there's this crash and it sounded exactly like the thing that we already fixed in the patch. So we thought, ah, oh, what, what happened here? And so we went through, we built the patch, submitted the patch, we, well, we booked for it, submitted it, went through it, went through the green light process, got it approved, hit yes, you know, uh, accepted the liability, clicked every single checkbox, green light, yes, yes, for everything, but we missed the final yes. So that entire patch was sitting there not yet deployed, 
Uh, and so all of the press who played the game had the version that had the crash in it, so maybe none of them hit it. Uh, but then, you know, day one we saw that, and all we did was we had to flip the switch and turn the patch on. So that's, that's a, another, like, just make sure you've gone all the way through the process and know these systems, like the back of your hand. Um, and so, you know, how do you get started as a PlayStation VR developer? Um, you know, you would become a certified Sony developer. Just go to PlayStation.com slash develop and you can sign up and then talk to an account manager about getting a Unity PlayStation license and it's free uh, and you can bring your games to PlayStation VR like we did. So thank you very much. And I think, uh, I know that we're running over, but I know that there's some gap, unless someone pulls us off stage. Uh, Gabe, if you want to join us for a quick Q&A. Um, Does anybody have any questions? Any questions? Um, yeah, just I mean, repeat I, the question. Just yeah. yeah, the question is: uh, Is there a kind of a third-party vendor that would help you with the ratings process? Right? Uh, I know for sure if you're developing on our platform, the ESRB is relatively painless. I mean, you just tell us you want an ESRB rating, yeah. and we'll broker that for you. Uh, I don't know what the situation is in Europe, um, but uh, I guess for third parties, I'm not sure. I mean, yeah. you guys, uh, we did ESRB. It was very uh, simple and fast. Uh, Peggy was slightly longer, but it was also fairly quick. Um, I think when you start to get into uh, the Asia region and Japan, zero ratings and all that, if you're doing that, you might, uh, it depends, you might want to have someone else help on that side. Um, but yeah, I think the process is uh, pretty like simple, so yeah. I, don't, I don't think you need to really rely on a third party to help you and get yeah. those ratings. Yeah. Um, well, making the games itself. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, as uh, Alex talked about performance, I think you know performance is a very important tenet of uh, a very, you know, good VR experience. So I, I know you guys work very hard, and along the way, we had to make a lot of changes on the Unity tools, as right. well as our, a lot of our libraries. And it was a lot of improvement that you know, if you're starting to develop now, you'll inherit all of those all those uh, benefits. But it's yeah. still not easy, right? Because you know, every game is different. Optimization is just something you just have to dive into your code and just kind of pull out things that you thought was necessary but not really necessary in your game. So the question was the, uh, the whole transparencies optimization. Yeah. How'd you do it? <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> We just had less transparencies. Uh, I mean, the game is mostly uh, opaque rendered content. And uh, you know, if your game is a game where you look through 17 layers of dirty glass in order to see the content, like, that might not be the best game design for, for that. Uh, you know. So one thing that we ended up doing was we ended up switching, depending on different platforms, different particle effects. Because if certain ones had more overdraw than others, um, I don't think a player would ever notice. Um, but essentially, that allowed us to kind of uh, pick the points in which we were having performance um, issues and kind of tackle those individually. Yeah. But we would not have known that it was that specific, specific particle effect if uh, we hadn't done deep profiling and figured out, okay, that's, it's actually this, and then doing a lot of kind of like A-B test. Oh, okay, let's turn off these particles and see how it runs, and then look at the graphs again and go, oh man, it was actually those. Building one that looks 95% the same, but it's actually just a slightly different blend mode or whatever, and then fixed it and yeah. moved on. Uh, there's hands in the way in the back. Um, so I guess conceptually, this idea of taking a project reactor and putting it into this bus, that's going to be very much. But can you talk a little bit, say, with respect to the car and the mechanics of how you work it through? I'm really struggling to see how that would adapt well to 
Um, the question so was they, uh, the, oh, the automotive, specifically, how did you get the automotive car mechanic scene <laughs> to work in uh, PlayStation VR's tracking setup? So that was actually a huge problem, even in like full 360 tracking, because a car is a very, very large thing, and play spaces are not that large. Um, there's a few things we ended up doing specifically for that was the cars are actually a little bit shorter than cars in real life. We don't, they don't have a back seat; they're just like all single seaters. Um, so that was one, and then we ended up making. Uh, so when the car ends up coming into your play space, and this is on all platforms, it has this easing curve where it comes into your physically into your play space really slowly, then moves up and then crouches in a little bit more. So you don't feel like this speeding car is coming at you and you don't really notice it, but it allows the car to get a little bit further into your play space. And then the second, uh, the third thing was we end up having a dial that on PlayStation there's more notches to. So for example, um, there's like, you know, four front of the car, back of the car, left and right. Um, but due to uh, the play space being a little bit shorter, um, the one we were targeting on PlayStation, we ended up adding some more notches. Like for example, there is left front, left back. And so the, like, the tire will then center in the middle of your play space and stuff like that. It just, it's one of those things that there's no golden solution for, for every scenario. It's like, it's a giant game design problem that you need to tackle on, a, on an individual basis. And it's worth noting that uh, like in the environment, if you remember, is the cars clearly are forward. And then to the left is this, you know, chrome ornament maker machine, and then a painting. You could paint the color of the uh, the car on your facing left, and the content of the car here. And then on the right is the whole tool chooser, which has the kind of like non-Euclidean, all the wheels, all the ornaments, everything. And then behind you is just a table with some tchotchkes on it, and like a little bobblehead and some other stuff. And so, you know, it's. The, the key required elements, uh, facing left, facing forward, facing right, that's that forward 180. So it's not just like only right here. You can extend and use your hands in, all, yeah. in multiple directions. And for example, that table behind you, we ended up utilizing the top of the chroma fire box as like another table surface that then was on your left. It just yeah. causes you have to rethink kind of how people are going to interact with that space. Yeah, I think what it comes down to, it's all about your particular piece of content and making it so that um, it's not you know, something that the player has to worry about. It's that now everything is within the accessible space. And someone who plays PlayStation VR version of Job Simulator thinks this is, what, this is the platform this is absolutely built for. They might not know about any of the other ports or other platforms. Everything feels right. Everything's accessible. I never had uh, a moment of frustration or unreachability. It's just this is the thing. And that's how we want all of our uh, you know, platforms to feel like. It's like they're the first, everyone's the first class citizen. And we do a lot of work to never make it feel like one platform is uh, different or below any other. Yeah. So we take probably one more and then. Yeah, one more question. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned late updates and updates like eliminating that part of the game uh, to kind of help with performance at the point. Uh, do you have any sort of resources out there that can kind of talk about doing that? So you're, uh, talking about how not to use update and late update? Um, as for resources, uh, one thing, that, um, if you're kind of new to Unity optimizations, look into mobile optimizations, particularly older things where people are talking about how to optimize for like iPhone 3GSs and stuff like that. Because with VR, you end up running into the same problems, right? And, and you end up having a lot of pixels you need to draw to, but like a weaker GPU and a CPU that's a little bit weaker. And so you end up running into the exact same problems. So that's definitely one place to, uh, to look. But uh, the other part of the problem is kind of think about what you're needing to do in a late in a late update or an update and be like, is this something I need to check every single frame? Is it something that maybe I could listen to something else that told it when to do something? Um, but yeah, definitely use resources for like mobile uh, mobile development. Yeah, I would like to add a couple of things on that because uh, you know I you know see a lot of different developers and sometimes when I see a team that's starting a you know, PSVR project and they're using dual Titan, you know like. <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, 8-core, you know, like the, the, you know, the most powerful PC on the planet, right? And our system's not about that, but unfortunately, you know, there's a lot of techniques and optimizations you can have, uh, and I think there's also a lot of great tools. Uh, Unity provides a lot of great profiling tools. Our own platform, uh, we have engineers dedicated on providing great tools like the Razer, CPU, and GPU. Those all work uh, very easily out of the box, and those are your friends, and they'll give you a lot of information about how your game is performing under the you know, hardware, hardware, and you can you know, make a lot of great uh, you know, performance optimizations that way. All right. OK, I think we're going to wrap it up. And thank you very Thanks, much. Guys. Thanks. <laughs> thank you very much. I think that was great.